When you're working with values or objects in memory, their lifetime, which is when it's safe to access that memory and when it's no longer safe or when it's expired, depends upon the segment of memory that the object is stored in. We previously looked at the lifetimes of automatic variables that are stored on the stack inside of a function's call frame. In this video, we're going to look at the static memory lifetime. Uh, and in the next video, we'll look at dynamic memory and dynamic lifetimes. Static memory is an area of memory that is actually much easier to reason about than automatic memory or dynamic memory, uh, because as we'll see, it stays in the same place and will only have one copy of any given variable in static memory. So let's dive right into it. Before we get into the details of static memory, it's worth refreshing the difference between compile time and runtime. When you're writing in a programming language like C or C++ uh, or Swift, there's a translation step between your code being written and it being turned into an executable binary. And this process is a multi-step process. We're not gonna get into the details of it, but we're gonna call the, the moment at which you try and compile your program compile time. And there's certain tools that are, are applied during compile time, the uh, type checking and, uh, and, and static analysis for whether or not you've initialized variables and some other things we'll, we'll discuss in just a bit. Um, that happen only at compile time. They don't happen when your program is running. So when you actually go and run an instance of your program and begin a process that your operating system is managing, that is your, a running instance of your program that's been compiled, we call that runtime. And this is your program when it's in motion, when you run dot slash a dot out or whatever you've named your uh, executable binary, uh, that's what we consider runtime. And this is when you might have runtime errors. So there's a difference between the analysis and the errors you might get at compile time and those that you get at runtime. There's some additional stages and nuance to this as well, um, but for the purposes of thinking about static memory, these two are important uh, when we compare and contrast static memory with automatic memory. So just to refresh what we learned about with automatic memory or variables that are allocated in frames on the call stack is that uh, one of the things that we didn't discuss head on, but we should hopefully be able to recognize is that in advance, we can't necessarily know the address that uh, a local variable in a function call frame is going to have. Like you can't know this at compile time. And the reason for this is because the control of your program is going to be governed in most non-trivial programs by side effects. Either the user's giving you some input or you're reading some input from the file or the network. Some kind of side effect is deciding the behavior of your program. And so there's no way to know when you compile your program which particular path that, uh, or all of the particular paths or decision points that are gonna be made uh, at the various conditional uh, or jump uh, instructions. And so this has the effect of uh, making it such that automatic variables, you cannot know the address of an automatic variable in advance uh, in a generalized sense. Uh, for a very simple program that really didn't have any meaningful call or function calls or that didn't have any side effects whatsoever, uh, you could write a compiler that could know the exact memory address of each uh, local variable in a call fr frame. Um, but generally, we can't know this. Another reason for this is because you can have calls to the same function from many different places in your program, meaning from different levels on the call stack. And so whenever we use printf, you can imagine having a program where you've got a main function and some other subroutine, some other function, and both of them contain calls to printf. Well, your call to printf from the main function would occur right below main. Uh, your call to printf from a uh, from from your subprocedure would be you know two levels down in your call stack, and at a, and its frame would begin at a different memory offset, right? So um, you don't necessarily know there are going to be multiple different areas on the call stack where a call to a function can occur from. So it's hard to know. And, and in fact, it's generally impossible to know uh, the exact address of where an automatic memory, uh, automatic variable will be in memory. Additionally, when you are writing recursive functions, we know that multiple frames to the same function, so multiple instances with the same local variable are gonna to need to be on the call stack. So when you have a recursive function, uh, you can't know uh, generalizably 
which addresses in memory your local variables for each of those frames will be, and there's going to be multiple instances, right? So one of the things that uh, we just have to recognize about automatic variables and the influence that this has on lifetimes is that we have a, a short duration in which we know that we are able to use a an automatic variable. Its lifetime begins once it's been initialized and it ends once it falls out of scope. Right? So there's a, a there's a finite uh, sequence of, of or there's a finite area in our program where an automatic variable uh, is considered to be a valid and initialized value in our program whose lifetime has begun and not yet expired. Right? So the point of this is to say you can't generally know the address in advance of an automatic variable. But we're going to contrast that with static variables. That's the focus in, in static memory, the focus of this video. And so in this example, we're going to look at a static variable that's defined locally inside of the counter function. And I'm going to encourage you to pause the video here and try and imagine what is the output of this particular function. Uh, spend about 10 seconds thinking through this. All right, so hopefully uh, you have encountered the idea of a static local variable before. Uh, if not, this is gonna come as a big surprise. So if this is your first time seeing a static local, uh, let's try running this program and looking at its behavior. So I'm going to uh, open up counter.c, and of course this is the exact same uh, program that we were just looking at. And if I compile this, so gcc, Counter.c. I'm not going to include the warning flags uh, for now. I know this is a valid program. Uh, and wow, look at that. One, two, three is what gets printed out. So if we think about this for just a moment, uh, I want you to reflect on this for one more second. Why must that be? What is interesting and special about declaring the count variable inside of counter as static? If we had not declared this as static. So if we imagine what was this, this function, uh, how this would behave if this were a normal automatic variable named count, um, we would imagine, okay, we've got a, a main function frame and uh, it's going to call the counter function, right? So we're gonna set up another frame for counter and inside counter, we're gonna have this count variable and count is initialized to be zero. So if we imagine we're, we're getting rid of the static uh, declaration here and we're saying this is just a local automatic variable and we in the return statement uh, give the prefix plus plus so that means we're going to actually increment the value of the count variable before we evaluate it in return and ultimately the return value here would be one right and so the first printed output would be one right and once this function call returns that counter uh, frame gets reclaimed. Um, what we've seen before is that nothing actually special happened. We, the, the computer is actually just keeping track of where's the bottom of the call stack. And before it would have been at the bottom of counter. And then now after it returns, it would be back in main. And so the next call to counter occurs and another frame for counter is set up. And once again, oops, uh, I want to keep that we're not using the static declaration in this example, count gets initialized to zero again and then count gets incremented to one, it returns and output is one, right? So without the static vari uh, variable declaration here, you are familiar with the idea that, th that the count variable will reset and reinitialize each time this function call occurs, and we would just get three ones as our output. But that wasn't the output that we received when we used the static declaration. So what's going on? Well. To jump the gun just a little bit, I'm gonna reveal that there's an area in memory called static memory. And it's further down, much, much further down on the call stack. And the way this gets allocated is uh, going to be a little bit compiler specific. We're not gonna get into the details here, but this count variable that is static is scoped within the counter function. So I might just make it a, a note that we're, we're talking about counter and I'm gonna use a hash symbol here, count, to say that uh, this is actually a name, a variable name, 
declared inside the counter uh, function and the, the variable name is count and it's initialized to zero. We're gonna come to see that this gets initialized as soon as the program begins, before main even get, gets to be evaluated, before the first line of main or the first instruction of main is executed, our static memory uh, is gonna be established in the process, right? And that line is gonna, even though it looks like this is the first line of our function, because we declared this as static, it's going to evaluate, again, as soon as the function begins, all of our st statically declared variables will be initialized and then that particular line doesn't get evaluated again. Its influence is to initialize static memory and then we're done, right? So now when we run this program, we, we see this, uh, call it a counter. So we would add another frame for counter. And now this name count is bound to static memory, right? So this line is not gonna have any effect. Uh, the count uh, uh, declaration line doesn't really have any instruction that would be associated with it when we go to call a counter. What happens is uh, the compiler associates the, word, the name count inside of this function to be bound to this, uh, this space in memory, in static memory. And so that space in static memory would be incremented by one and then its value would be returned, which would cause uh, the value one to be printed out. Right, so then output is one, right? The second time the counter call is incurred as part of a printf uh, evaluation, another call to counter would be evaluated. Again, this wouldn't have any effect because this was a static variable declaration that had the effect of setting up this variable before the program began. Um, but the word count will refer to this particular address in memory, is bound to this particular address. And so we increment count again, and we would return that value. And back in main, we would print out two. And the same idea for three, right? So the key idea here is that when we start thinking about static memory, we're thinking about a segment of memory that's separate from our automatic call stack. And we're gonna see that these values are singletons and that uh, they're established and initialized as soon as the process begins before any evaluation of the main function begins. All right, so let's get into some more details here. First, we should talk about static analysis. This is the idea that I mentioned earlier that your code is gonna be analyzed as part of the compilation process. So things like type checks, you said that you were gonna return an integer, but you actually returned a double floating point precision value that might result in a type error. Uh, you said that uh, you were trying to assign some two incompatible types to one another, uh, to a, one, one type that's incompatible with another to a variable, uh, and you would get a type check error there, right? So the type checking that happens to be sure that your program is validly typed, this is considered part of the static analysis process. And when you have compilation errors for things like you tried to assign a string to an integer, uh, th these would show up at compile time because they're part of the static analysis pipeline. There's some other things, like if you tried to use a variable before you initialized it, if you have those warning checks enabled, you would get some um, diagnostic information there. If you try to call a function before you actually declared it or forward declared it as we do in C, you can get a warning there. If there's an unused variable, you declared a variable, but it never actually got used in any meaningful expression or statement after its declaration, you'll get a warning there. Um, and then if there are certain code paths, like if you have a function that's supposed to return an integer and you have an if else statement and only in the if statement do you return something in the else statement you don't return anything, uh, you'll get some static analysis diagnostic that says, hey, it looks like there's a code path that doesn't actually return. The word static implies at rest. So this is when your code is being compiled, it's not actually running, right? So your, your code isn't trying to be evaluated. Um, it's being analyzed. And so things that are, are statically analyzed are typically gonna be decided at compile time, especially in a language that uh, compiles to a binary uh, like C or C++. When we're th talking about dynamic languages that uh, are scripted and interpreted like Python or uh, PHP or JavaScript, those are gonna have 
slightly different uh, trade-offs here because you're actually, you're not necessarily compiling anything um, or it's a much more nuanced compilation process. But for a traditional language like C, where we have an explicit compilation step that transforms your code into a binary, uh, static analysis happens during compilation. And uh, when we're talking about static memory, what we're saying here is that we're actually gonna, we can know we, whatever variables that you declared as static, or we'll also see global variables are gonna be considered and stored in static memory space as well. Uh, the program can analyze run through all of your lines of code, the compiler can figure out, well, what, what are all of the static variables in your program? And it can go ahead and reserve space in static memory, or at least know the offsets within static memory that it's going to decide, hey, here's where I'm gonna store, you know, in that previous example, uh, the, the count static variable would be decided to be stored at some offset of static memory as soon as the program began and this would be built into, compiled into the program. Uh, so uh, what we can do with static analysis and static memory is figure out before a program even goes to run, decide how we're going to arrange static variables in that segment of memory uh, so that they can be initialized and set up before your main function even begins evaluating. We've previously talked about uh, address space layout randomization, ASLR, and this is that security feature which uh, when you go to run a process, it will randomize the exact starting address of some segment in memory so that your, you know, your, your stack might uh, shift around between each run of your program at some random offset in some uh, bigger space that it, was, uh, that it can exist in. Same idea with your static memory. So your static memory won't always be in the exact same place uh, because of address space layout randomization, uh, but within the static memory, like from the offset of where it begins, after your program's compiled, uh, from that offset, every variable will, each time you run your program, be stored at the exact same offset. So we can look at a couple of examples of this and start to get a feel for where in our virtual memory space relative to our call stack is static memory, right? So we remember there's the call stack and above that, that's where the program arguments and environment variables are passed in. And then there's this space at the bottom that we haven't explored yet. And uh, let's see if we can find uh, out whether or not our static variables are gonna be stored in that area. So if I uh, look in the static addresses.c program, and if you wanna re reproduce this, uh, it might be a good little program to reproduce, but notice I've got a, just a plain old global variable. I've got a static global variable, and I should make a note here, private to file. Uh, for, when it comes to global variables, the key difference between just a, an unadorned global variable like this global here versus the static is that uh, C uses the static keyword to effectively scope or namespace this particular variable so that it's only accessible within this file. When we start having multi-file C programs, your global variables will actually be addressable or accessible to other C files that are compiled together if they so choose to uh, make use of that global namespace. But the static namespace winds up being specific to the individual uh, C object file that, that gets compiled, right? And then we've got a static variable that's local to main and a regular automatic variable, right? So these are four different kinds of variables uh, that have slightly nuanced different trade-offs. We just looked at in the previous example, the impact or the meaning of a static local variable, right? So here, this is a, a variable who's going to be a singleton value in static memory. So there's only ever gonna be one uh, variable named static local, and it's going to be initialized to three and it will be stored in static memory space. And that's as opposed to uh, this automatic variable that would be in the frame for main rather than in static memory space, right? Thanks to having declared it as just a character. So when we go and we print the addresses, we should get a sense of how are these variables related to one another in memory uh, in terms of where they're being laid out and uh, assigned. So I'm going to uh, GCC static addresses and dot slash a dot out. So let's take a look at what we're seeing here. So uh, these hex addresses 
Notice that global, static global, and static local all begin with the same prefix, right? In fact, all but the very last uh, character is the same, right? So we have 10, 11, 12. These are all care uh, variables, so they all took one byte in, in memory. And so the addresses uh, just increased, right? So from the first variable we declared, second, third, uh, the variable, the address increased. Notice that the first characters of this are uh, pretty small or relatively small compared to the high order bits or the high order values of our automatic variable, right? So our automatic variable was the one that's in main's frame. It wasn't declared static. It was just a, an automatic local variable. And its high order bits here are significantly larger than the high order bits of static memory. And this feels like they're like the difference between seven and five isn't very large. Uh, but if you actually subtracted out the hexadecimal representations, you'd see that these are eons apart, effectively. These are, these are very, very far apart in our virtual memory space. Right? And so our call stack we're going to see is here. And our static memory is going to be towards the bottom uh, of our virtual memory space. Right? And you can convince yourself of that by trying to compile this program. Uh, as I mentioned, if I were to run this again, we'll see that we're not going to have the exact same memory addresses, but they're going to be in the same vicinity due to address-based layout randomization. So to uh, go back to that diagram that I uh, sloppily drew, here's a, a slightly better looking uh, implementation of that diagram. We know the places that we've explored so far, environment and arguments that are being passed into our program as the process has begun then the call stack is going to be at the very top of our virtual memory space. And then down towards the bottom, there's still two areas that we'll explore in due time. Um, but what we're looking at today is static memory. And there are two different segments within static memory that are worth mentioning. First are initialized data values. So uh, the initialized variables in your program that are begun with a value other than zero are going to have their values loaded in before the main function call gets evaluated, like as part of loading this process, uh, the initialized data is going to be copied all into one block. And then values for variables whose uh, are either uninitialized uh, or are initialized to zero will go into the uninitialized data part of static memory. Global variables and static variables will all be stored in this space. And the reason why the initialized data is separated from the uninitialized data is really just an efficiency. Um, when your binary program compiles, it can set aside a sequence of bytes that will contain all of the initialized values at the correct offsets uh, for all of your static and global variables that are initialized and copy in you know, one contiguous chunk just as the program is loading in memory to begin the process. Uh, for your initialized data. And then it can just zero out the uninitialized part and be good to go. Uh, this is more efficient than uh, needing to store uh, zeros in between your data. So this would cause your binaries to be bigger and cause the copying process to take longer if, we, if these two values were interleaved and there wasn't more intentional organization uh, given to them. Even if you uninitialize a static or global variable, when your program begins, that memory is guaranteed to be zeroed out on your behalf. This is different from automatic variables where if you don't initialize them, you're gonna have a garbage value that uh, is coming from whatever was previously stored at this memory address in your virtual memory space. And so I want you to ignore the fact that it will automatically be initialized to zero and always remember to initialize your, your variables. Even if they're static or global, I would encourage you to just zero them out to begin with. And this is good practice because if you later change your mind and try and convert something to from global uh, or, or from a static local to a, an automatic local, you uh, might accidentally introduce a bug if you were depending on it initializing to zero uh, automatically. So there's an important concept here that we need to distinguish between uh, lifetime and scope. There's a relationship between lifetime and scope in automatic variables. But now that we've introduced static lifetimes, 
in static scope, we are, or, or I should say global scope, we should recognize that lifetime and scope are not uh, the same. And, and, and this is gonna be especially true in the third segment of memory, uh, dynamic memory and dynamic lifetimes. So the concept of lifetimes is when is a memory address safe for reading and when is it expired, right? And we're thinking about you know, objects in memory and the, the purpose that was assigned to some object in memory. When in your program can you depend on that actually being uh, what you would expect it to be and what you had intended it for it to be versus you know, overwritten by some other call stack frame uh, value or something else? And when is it expired? When, when can you no longer access some object in memory and, and trust and know that it's uh, what you expected to be there and what you intended to be reading, right? So for automatic and stack variables, these two concepts are, are closely related. An object in memory is safe or a, an address in memory is safe after it's been initialized. Now, recognize that you can, the scope of some variable name and the, the memory address that it refers to and gets bound to when a function call occurs, that begins bef potentially before initialization, right? Because we looked at previous examples where uh, you could read a variable or read some memory before it had been initialized. And you could do that because that variable was already in scope, right? You already have, when we're talking about is something in scope, that means can you um, address it by its variable name? Uh, and so we could address a variable or an, uh, an area of memory before it was initialized. So the scope uh, for an automatic variable is potentially bigger or longer than its lifetime, right? And uh, a, the, the memory address of an automatic variable is, expires once it falls out of scope, whether we're talking about block scope or a function call scope. So there's a close relationship between these two concepts, but they're not quite the same. Okay. For static variables, these two things are completely unrelated, right? Uh, we've just seen local static variables that are declared inside of functions and the scope of that local static variable is within the scope of that function, right? You can't access uh, a local static variable outside of, of the function that was defined unless you uh, give that memory address through, through, some, through a pointer uh, in, a, in, a, in a clever, tricky, hacky way, right? Um, but generally, lifetime of a, of a static variable is from when the process begins, like as soon as the main function begins evaluating, all of your static variables are technically alive, like their lifetime has begun, uh, and all of the static variables expire. Your static memory expires once your process ends, right? So the lifetime of a static variable or static memory, it spans the entire duration of your process's lifetime. But the scope might be global, meaning you could access it from anywhere in your program, uh, but it can also be local as we've seen like in the counter example. And so these two concepts are unrelated to one another, uh, are, are, are different from one another. They are related to one another in that uh, with automatic variables, there is some dependency, right? What we'll see in dynamic memory, which will be in the next video is that uh, it's even harder. We, it's, it's on us to decide when uh, a, uh, the lifetime of some value in memory begins and when to expire it. And it will be completely unrelated to scoping. This concept and starting to get comfortable with the idea of the lifetime of some space in memory um, being, you have to think about it's when it's safe to use different from when you necessarily have access to it or when you have a handle on its scope. Uh, and this is a, something that takes some time to get comfortable with uh, and takes practice and, and, and knowing what to look out for. There's one other important um, part, or, or there's one other important concept to mention when it comes to static memory. And this has to do with the way C strings are stored, right? So I would encourage you to try pausing the video here and seeing if you can draw out uh, what you would expect the rough, roughly, just a, a very rough sketch of what the memory layout of, of this particular program might look like. And I wanna point out specifically that lines five and six are what are actually important in this main function, right? So notice that A is a character array and B is a pointer to a character. 
right? So I'm pause the video here and try thinking through, is there a difference between A and B? And if so, what is it? As a quick hint, B is a pointer to a string that's gonna be allocated in static memory. Whereas A is an array of cares that is going to be allocated uh, dynamically uh, in, or automatically, I should say, in the frame uh, for main. So just to walk through very quickly how this winds up working, uh, if we imagine, and I, this is gonna be a very, very rough sketch, uh, we've got a frame for main, and we've got some static memory. When in C, you are initializing a C string like we are here that gets assigned to a, a pointer to a, a character, right? Um, C treats this differently than an array. And this is really subtle and very surprising, right? But the, the general uh, gist of this is that in static memory somewhere, uh, C before the process really begins in the mainframe, so I probably shouldn't even have drawn the mainframe yet, uh, there's gonna be an array that has the character B in it and the null character, right? So our, our null terminated string. And this is stored in static uh, memory somewhere. In mains frame, when this program begins, uh, C is going to, uh, or the, the, the executable is going to allocate some space for the A character and also uh, the, uh, the null termination of this string, right? And the variable, or I should say the array named A, uh, it's not technically a, a variable because it's declared as an array. I'm gonna say that it refers to, uh, or is bound to uh, this particular address that stores the character A followed by the null character, right? So A is bound to this address. And B is gonna be a pointer that's actually bound to static memory, right? And you're probably thinking, why, why the subtle difference? Um, and we could go run this program to, to convince ourselves that this is true. In fact, I would encourage you uh, to do that. So let me uh, clear this and just to open this file up and convince ourselves this is exactly the same as what we saw before. Uh, IGCC, C strings, and dot slash A dot L. So A, Remember when you have an array in C and you access that name directly without any subscription or indexing, you are effectively accessing the address of the first byte of the first element in the array. And that is you know, a high address, which means we can be somewhat certain it's in our call stack. Well, the address of B, which is a pointer to the, the, the string, uh, sorry, a pointer to a character string or a C string, uh, notice that it's referring to a static memory address. And this all was just because of the simple difference in declaration. If we looked at what is the address of the variable B, which is a pointer variable, we could see that the address of B, so uh, remember a pointer is actually a memory address. So if, if I wanted to be a little bit more correct here, um, A, uh, it is really just going to be uh, whatever address this was in, in the frame for main, right? Uh, and these variable names don't actually exist at runtime uh, unless you compile with debug settings. But let's imagine this is, um, actually we can just use this address here. So I'm just going to say ox7f dot 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 06 and a the variable name would store or, or be bound to ox7f dot, 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 06 and b is going to be, uh, it's going to have some space in memory and what it's going to store is the 64-bit pointer to, uh, so the address of this is ox55 dot 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 c4 and so B, right, uh, is going to store OX55 dot 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 C4, which is our static address down in static memory. Uh, and 
the name B in our program is gonna be bound to, uh, this is C4, 7C4, uh, oops, no, uh, 7F8. So notice that A and B are very close to one another, uh, but uh, B is slightly lower. Uh, and so B would be OX7F dot dot 7F8. Right, and really that's just referring to the box or the, the, the object in memory that stores the pointer. And that pointer is really just the address of this segment in seg uh, this object in static memory. Um, the key thing to recognize here is that you have to be careful when you are working with C strings. And the big trade-off here is what you can do with an array of characters that's initialized in the way that we're seeing here versus what you can do with a pointer to a C string that gets stored in static memory. So what we just talked about is the idea that when you initialize a character array, that character array has its contents stored in the frame on the call stack and you're free to change the contents of that character array. You can reassign new values to it. However, when you initialize a string that's type is a care pointer and is assigned a reference or, or the address of a uh, C string that gets stored in static memory, that memory is read only uh, for performance purposes and for sort of pragmatic purposes. And this is confusing because it seems like you should be able to change the contents of some string either way. Um, but if we tried to change uh, one of the characters in the care pointer, and we can try that in just a moment, we would see that there is a segmentation fault that occurs. We're trying to change some uh, segment of our static memory that it gets marked as read only. So we can't actually do that. So this is an optimization. And one of the reasons why uh, this distinction exists is to give you some control. Once you know that you have this control uh, to decide, do you want to, um, if you need the ability to change the characters of a character array, uh, you get to allocate that in your call frame. And that's a pretty expensive process, right? When you um, call a function, if it has to set up a brand new array for the string, each time you call that function, there's just more steps involved on the processor's side of things to initialize that function frame. For a string that you don't actually expect to change, right? So a lot of strings that we use in our programs are just for output purposes and are never gonna change. Uh, and so it's an optimization that for these care pointers, we store them in static memory in a read-only area so that we are guaranteed there's no surprises that when you go to access that again, that it hasn't changed because someone else in your program is, has mucked around with it. And so this winds up being much more efficient uh, and gives, us, gives you sort of the best of both worlds. If you really needed a character array that you needed to modify, you've got one way of doing it by declaring character array. If you're using a, a string that is never gonna change, you can declare it uh, a care pointer. But as a PSA, because this is very confusing and you won't even get a compiler error, this will wind up being a runtime error if you just declare a care pointer and assign it a, a C string literal. Uh, if you went to go and change it, you wouldn't get a compiler error, you would get a segmentation fault when your program ran. And that feels bad, right? Segmentation faults are things that we definitely want to avoid. And so you can actually catch this at static compile time by declaring your uh, care pointer as const and I wanna give you a demonstration of this uh, just to show you a little bit more about it. So I'm gonna open uh, that C strings file again. And here, uh, again, uh, the B string is the one that we can't change. So let me just show you, for example, uh, if we said A sub zero is now gonna be the character capital A and I were to print uh, the contents of that and let me print this as a string actually uh, and, and we can do this because this is the first address of a character array that begin or that ends in a null termination uh, character right because we declared this as a c string literal up here there's that implicit null termination character that is added to the end right now let's try the same thing with b so b sub zero 
which we know we can do because we can use subscription notation on a pointer. And this does the arithmetic for us to dereference B. Uh, and I'm gonna change that to a capital B character and try printing B instead. So, uh, oops. Let me just uh, change this in one sec. And change that and write my program, save it out and compile it. And let me just do this with warnings as well. All right, so notice even with warnings, no warnings, totally fine. And we go and we run this program and notice uh, we printed out the A capital A. And then when we tried to change that value in B, when we tried to write to memory that was uh, allocated in the, the static read only space and, and any C strings you use that you assign to care pointers uh, by convention are gonna be assigned to this read only static memory space, we got that segmentation fault. So if you are ever finding yourself declaring a variable in this way, that's a pointer to a character uh, that is assigned a string, know that you can't change this. This is gonna be a read only string that you're assigning this value to. So your best bet is to declare this as a const. And when you do that, notice that we got this little in Vim, this little sh double chevron over here to say that, hey, there's something wrong with this. And if we hover over that line of code at the bottom, we get a little bit of helpful uh, diagnosis that says read only variable is not assignable. And if I were to try running this GCC again, notice that uh, we get an error that says, hey, you can't assign to a read only location uh, because we had declared it as const. And this is one of those sort of pro tips of when you find yourself wanting to use a string literal in your programs and uh, you use a, a care pointer to, uh, to access it and set up uh, a pointer to the first character in your C string, you should go ahead and declare it as const because if you later try to change it for some reason, you'll get better diagnostics at compile time at, during static analysis. Uh, if you do so. In general, it's also better, and if you know that you're not gonna change a string, like you're setting up a string literal and you're, and you're never gonna change it once your program begins running, it is much better to declare a const care pointer than it is to declare a care array, right? And the reason for that is the care array is more expensive because it needs to get set up in your call frame each time that uh, that array gets initialized. So just as a quick recap of the two uh, segments of memory that we've looked at in the related respective lifetimes. For automatic variables stored on the call stack, you are safe to use those variables after you've, or that memory uh, after you've initialized it. And that memory will expire when either the function call returns or the variable falls out of scope if you declared it inside of a block scope. So the thing that you need to be careful not to do is accidentally return or share the address of some automatic variable outside of its scope. And in the previous video, we looked at some examples of how you might accidentally do that. For static memory, and this applies to both static variables and global variables, you can also have static global variables, um, but that winds up just impacting their scope. Uh, they're always safe to use uh, because any variable, even if you don't initialize it, it gets zeroed out uh, that's in static memory. That being said, you should always initialize and explicitly zero out your variables if you wanted them to be initialized to zero, uh, but just always initialize your variables. Don't pay attention to whether or not they're static or, or automatic. These never expire they are valid for the duration of your program. Uh, and so you are free to read them as you see fit. But you need to be careful because there are segments of static memory that are read only, specifically the strings. When you allocate a string literal in C and you don't assign it immediately to a character array in some function, it's going to be initialized as static memory that's read only. And so you'll get a segmentation fault if you attempt to write to read only static memory. You also wanna be careful 
especially for global variables and, and specifically for global variables, uh, when you might have conflicting rights to a global variable from places that are unexpected. In general, you really want to avoid global variables because they make your programs much harder to reason about. And the reason for that is you have to trace through an entire execution of a program to know who has actually modified, which function calls actually modified some global variable if it's not read only. Generally, assigning uh, variables that you don't expect to change as constants will help you avoid unintentional mistakes uh, when attempting to write to some read only area of memory. So this sets us up to, in the next video, talk about the third and for our purposes, final segment of memory and their respective lifetimes, which is dynamic memory and the heap. And this is where we will wind up storing our much larger arrays and larger objects uh, that we want to have more control over their lifetimes than we have with either call stack or static memory. So look forward to working with you on that in the next lecture and great work thinking through static lifetimes.